What a lovely arrangement, sweet hour of prayer, love that. Good morning, welcome to worship with First English Baptist Church. We got a beautiful day today, didn't we? Thank you for joining us, and if you're joining us by the radio or the internet, we welcome you also. We do have people in the congregation, and we're wearing masks to, to be safe for our community. Um, I encourage you, if you can, to please get vaccinated. That's what will help us get through this. Um, but thank you for being caring of, of others here. I know it's a little, little awkward and inconvenient. I don't enjoy them either, but we do what we need to do, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. We have some visitors today as well as regulars. Thank you. I hope that you find this experience worshipful and uh, important and inspiring as you go forward in the week. Let us, oh, before, let me do this quickly. You might have been given one of these envelopes. It says, let love flow, also the, the poster in front of the pulpit. This is the, the, the slogan for our one great hour of sharing. It's one of the four uh, special offerings that American Baptists receive each year. And uh, this particular one, one great hour of sharing, is, is especially appropriate because it is for relief efforts all around the nation and around the world. So when you think about trying to help people in Haiti or in New Orleans with flooding or other natural disasters, one great hour of sharing, not only American Baptists, but many different Christian denominations pool their resources through this giving and then it's dispersed to places and people that are in need. So if you're so inclined, this is a separate offering from the church uh, budget and so forth. Uh, just slip something in there and place it in the offering plate, and that will be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, again, ushers, if you would like to usher where you help people find seats and, and pass out the bulletins, it's a good way to meet people. Uh, please check the desk at the back, the table at the back for a list, a sign-up sheet. It's a very rewarding experience. I think everyone who does it would say. There are also some sheets back there regarding uh, special giving opportunities in, this, in this, the coming days. Uh, we, the churches of our area have a fair ministry to the fair workers that come for the Bloomsburg Fair later this month, and that includes distribution of, of clothing items. Uh, they're very specific about what can be useful. Um, it's listed on that sheet in the back. Please feel free to take one. There's also a, a, a special uh, clothing giveaway. I think it's 14th year, is that right? On October 14th, right? Just happened to be. Uh, where we invite the community to come and help themselves to clothing that is uh, clean, um, usable, and something that you, you would be comfortable giving to someone in your family, perhaps, or even using yourself, but maybe doesn't fit anymore. Anything like that. Um, there's a sheet in the back that explains that process, too. Most of you are, are familiar with that. So we're coming up on that in October. Again, thank you very much for joining us for worship. We begin with the bowl, the prelude, the uh, breath of life, and we move into prayer from there. I'm just going to call your attention to the prayer on the back of this bulletin, the prayer of St. Francis. I would like for us to say that in unison uh, after the invocation, and I'll invite you at that point to join me. Um, so we're moving our minds and spirits to a place of worship. Would you please stand with me, and we'll, we'll take our breath of life and begin together. I invite you to take this breath with me and imagine it as God's breath, God's spirit, God's wind, which energizes and animates and brings into existence and sustains everything that is, things seen and unseen, including each one of us. So as you take this breath, imagine breathing God's spirit of love, of grace, of forgiveness, of strength, of courage, of hope, of patience and perseverance, of kindness and gentleness and self-control. And as you release that breath, imagine releasing to God worries, anxieties, failures, discouragements, losses, griefs, whatever burdens, heaviness you may be carrying with you, imagine 
releasing that to God. And then we'll move into prayer and the prayer of St. Francis. So please join me a little exhale in one nice deep breath of life. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for that breath, every breath that we have. What a gift. Through that breath, you sustain us in this, in this world of mortality, but there is another breath, the breath of your spirit that is not bound by, by flesh and blood, but is in fact alive within us and beyond us and sustains us through the trials, the spiritual and physical trials of our lives and sustains us into your presence after death. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for raising us this morning so that we might be here with, with our neighbors and family and friends and brothers and sisters in faith. Please surround us with your loving care. Hold us in your arms of comfort and strength. Cover us with your wings of protection and grace. And hear our prayer, O oh God, a moment of silence, and then as we pray together an ancient prayer, of petition. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you. Lord, prepare us to be our sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving will be our living sanctuary for you. Amen. Please remain standing, even though it's not marked. We are going to stand as we sing together, leaning on the everlasting arms. It's number 496, 496 in your hymnal.
you. Please be seated. You'll notice our order of service is a bit different this morning. I hope that doesn't uh, confuse you. I know we get used to things a certain way, but um, today's a rather special Sunday. So in, in light of that, um, I have asked some, some of you, some of our congregation, uh, to consider a personal testimonial. Uh, and if you read down farther in the service, you'll see at the place where the us usually ha we have the sermon, it says, we share testimonies. And this is the question I've asked people and ask you as well to consider. How have I changed? How have I changed in the 20 years since 9-11-01? And where do I see God's presence in that change? How have I changed in the 20 years since 9-11? And where do I see God's presence in that change? And just to give some folks a little time to think about it, I, I asked, and there are some names there. Those are folks that have said they would, they would come forward at that point. Two or three minutes, a brief testimony. And if there's time for more, I'll, anybody else that would like to say something. I will, um, I will note that um, Karen's not able to do it this morning, but Linda has also volunteered since I printed this up. So, Linda, you can take <laughs> um, Karen's spot. And then if any other people here are moved to speak, please feel free at that point to, to come forward. And we'll just come up here. We'll use that mic, that um, handheld mic. And so I'm reading the Scripture early and preaching what you might say early. Um, the, the Scripture this morning is from the book of Psalm. Psalm 130. So allow me to read that. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O oh Lord, had kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. More than watchmen watch for the morning. More than watchmen watch for the wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all her sins. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. Amen. Today is Sunday, September 12th, 2021, the day after the 20th anniversary of the horror of 9-11. No words I could offer today would begin to do justice to the significance of that single day in the history of the world and in the personal histories of those killed, injured, and left behind. Anyone 20 years or younger has never experienced a pre-9-11 world. And those of us who have are steadily departing the world stage. In time, all humans living will be post 9-11, as we are all today post-Civil War. But if we ever doubted it before, we must realize by now that the past always inhabits the present. It is never entirely past. And so it is with 9-11. 
in dramatic and life-changing ways, as well as in countless ordinary moments. We live in a vastly different world today than we did 20 years and two days ago. No two human lives are identical. Your particular life and mine are each unique, one of a kind. No one has lived, nor is presently living, exactly the life experience that you are. No one else. Yet we are all flesh and blood, human and mortal. This implies a common basis for understanding, for compassion, for empathy across the entire human family. Love, hate, anger, delight, envy, selflessness, honor, shame, fear, courage, pain, relief, and a thousand other human experiences are common to all of us. Were this not so, community and even civilization, sacred or secular, would be impossible, a complete vanity. To be fully human requires listening and learning from each other and from our shared experience of living in a wonderful yet broken world. If September 11, 2001 teaches us anything, it teaches us how interconnected all humans are to each other, to this planet, and even across the lines and boundaries that we draw between religions, politics, laws, lands, and cultures. I chose to read for you today Psalm 130 because this anonymous human voice, whose particular circumstance is obscure to us, comes from a place we can all understand. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, Master, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I would wager that even atheists and agnostics can identify with this cry for help. Here is a person in deep distress, pouring out pain and desperation to the only one able to bring relief and peace, the Lord of all creation. The depths are likely a reference to the depths of the sea, a mysterious, uncontrollable world of watery chaos and darkness, of roiling waves and heaving water, in other words, the place of the dead, of suffocation, of oblivion. This cry, then, is like a plea from the grave, from any emotional or psychic space that feels like death. Only the humble, the needy, the ill, the ones overwhelmed and bereft, cry out for mercy. Right away, we know that this person is not too proud, not too self-assured, or too self-deceived to own her limitations, to confess his abject poverty before God. Remember, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. God has nothing to offer 
the self-sufficient. Only the brokenhearted need apply for help. The next word of the psalm disclose a profound awareness of how far this struggling person has fallen short of God's mark. A multitude of failures, lapses, sins haunt the past. They would be unsurvivable except that God has infinite mercy and forgiveness that keeps no record of wrongs. Here is a suffering soul who teeters on the brink of death. Physical, spiritual, psychic, emotional. We don't know the precise circumstance. But do you recognize that place? Anyway? Falling headlong into an abyss of despair? Of pain, of grief, of lostness, disorientation, disintegration, breathlessness. Yet, there remains a single path upward. A staircase, a ladder, a lifeline to the surface. And the psalmist turns that way toward the enduring light of a faithful sovereign, of one more powerful than all forms of death and disintegration. The only one who is and was and ever will be, in whom all that is has its being. How then does this desperate, despairing human being find that dangling lifeline in the darkness? I wait for the Lord, the psalmist writes. My soul, my whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. And Going forward, my soul, my whole being waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. The English word wait comes from Old English. The verb waiten, which meant to watch to observe, to look for. Essentially, waiting and watching are the same action. Visual and active, alert anticipation of that which is not yet, but is certain to come. The analogy of the sentinel, the watchman, peering through the last watch of the night, for the glowing hint on the eastern horizon of a new day dawning. This morning when I got up, I looked out my window. And lo and behold, in the fog and the clouds, between the trees, there was a magenta sun. It was a color I'd never seen the sun before. I took about 50 pictures of it. It was amazing. That happens every day. I don't see it. You don't see it. But it comes. Every day. And then the psalmist repeats that waiting which mirrors the action of waiting and captures that active continuous anticipation of a certain light that will come that will banish the shadows of night. Psalm 130, verse 6. My soul, and in Hebrew the word soul means my, my entire being, my whole self. My soul, my entire self, 
waits for, watches for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. That is the ladder up. That is the lifeline dangling in the darkness that engulfs us in our pit. To look up and out for the coming light of the Lord's faithfulness. Shadowlands of illness, injury, disease, despair, disintegration, lostness, fracture, those are real. But the light is coming. And shadows flee before light. The psalmist, in great despair, grabs that lifeline, reaches for that ladder. She waits for the Lord. He watches for the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Gospel of John begins with these words about Christ Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Psalm 130 is a personal, private plea between the Lord of all and one individual until the very last verse. And there it pivots, and it opens outward to encompass the entire nation, the entire community, God's people, Israel. The psalmist ends with a petition that the entire nation find the same lifeline, step up the same ladder out of the abyss of death into full redemption, complete rescue from the nation's lostness and brokenness. Verse 7, the last verse. O Israel, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full, complete redemption. The Lord will redeem Israel from all her wrongdoing. This psalm that begins in utter despair finds the light of hope. Because the Lord is faithful and good, the Lord comforts the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So where do we go from here? We go one foot in front of the other, one day at a time. That hard that simple. We wait. We watch for the light of the Lord. We continue in faith. We persevere. We endure. We keep watch. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watch women Wait for the morning. Amen. We come to a time of prayer together, intercessory prayer, where we pray for others beyond ourselves. As you think about whom you might want to offer to us all to pray for someone on your heart. I have retrieved the names that people have requested we pray for this morning from our Facebook page, and, and these are those I found. Today we're praying for Joan and Matt, for Jessica, Leslie, Deanna, Jeanette, Linda, Tammy, Nana Jo, Lois, Paul, and Jim. And I want to add 
the United States of America, families grieving loss, the Combs family, the Meldrum family, the Bauer family, the Carnes family, the Dion family, and victims of flood, storm, fire, and war. Do you have others you'd like us to pray for? Russ. Ella. Ella. Ellen. Ella. Ella. I'm sorry, Ella. Yes, Ella and Joe. Thank you. Dave. Betty. Betty. And Ed. And Ed. Char. Dave. Dave. And Anthony. And Anthony. Thank you. Eileen. Wendy, Royce, Joe, and Greg. Janet. Larry and Claire. Larry and Claire. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Eleanor. Charlotte. Charlotte. And Eleanor and Ralph. Anne. Sue and Kathy and Joe. Marty. The Road Armel. Schultz family. Thank you. Rosie. Edna, Faith, Peggy, that's right, I knew that was, Edna, Peggy, Connie, and Carol. I should know these people by now. Hannah, Davon, Barb and Matt, and Faith, yes ma'am. Doris, Claire, yes. Christina. Travis, Maddie, Bella, and Christina. Shirley. Lee Aaron. Lee Aaron. Got it. Sue. Uh, Tyson. Tyson. Charity. Charity. Walt. 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 Dan. Dan. And Alan Brenda. And Alan Brenda. Thank you. Dave. Nancy and Robin. Nancy and Robin. Absolutely. Joe. Rosemary. Rosemary. And Carol. And Carol. 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 Karen. Kara. Kara. Rosemary and Kara. Thank you. I miss anybody? I know there are others. Would you bow with me to, and we'll remember to the Lord these folks and others as we pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we turn to you, the one who holds all, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. May we never, ever forget that you are as close as the air we breathe. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, even in the midst of confusion and hurt and pain and uncertainty about the moments of today, next week, next year, the lives of our children, our grandparents, our friends and neighbors, ourselves. Thank you for your faithfulness. We hold on to that. Hear our prayers for these loved ones we have named today and for those also on our hearts but unnamed. You know their need. We pray, O oh God, that in the midst of their struggle and trial, whatever it may be, today they experience your grace in a special and healing way. That you surround them with your loving care and those who tend to them, giving them hope, courage, healing, faith, patience, assurance that they are not lost and they are not alone. We pray for the hurting people of our nation. This weekend has reminded us of many, many pains that go unnoticed by most of us but are present always for some people. We see signs of it everywhere and yet we don't see them at all. And these are not the only pains, not just 9-11, but 9-12 and 13 and all the other days of the year when people experience loss and grief and hurt and injustice and oppression and we fail to listen and we fail to help and we fail to act, sometimes even on our own best interest, not to mention that of our neighbor. Help us, O oh God, to learn from your word, to continue to listen, to pray, 
to find common ground, to love one another as Jesus loves us, to work together for a better place, a better life for all of the world's creatures, humans and others. Thank you for this beautiful, this beautiful world you create moment by moment that we get to enjoy. May we appreciate those moments you give us and those people around us and all the creatures that make life beautiful and good and wondrous and miraculous. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we remember together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me now as we gather together in worship to God, our tithes and our gifts? Gracious and ever-loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the many ways you bless our lives. What we've brought and given today is but a token of our gratitude and a part of what we give to you. We give all ourselves, all that we have and are, to your glory and your work and your kingdom. Please receive us and these gifts through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So as I, sorry, as I mentioned earlier, asking us to think about this question, how have I changed in the 20 years since 9-11-01, and where do I see God's presence in that change? So we have some folks that have prepared some remarks on that subject. And excuse me for looking at my phone a minute ago. The reason is because I forgot to print out, to read, what Travis wanted to say and is not here and able to say. And I'm running through my list of 
messages and I can't find it. Does Christina have it? Do you have it, Christina? I'm sorry. I will find it. It was a, it was a beautiful meditation that Travis found and wanted to read, and hopefully I'll find it. In the meantime, we also have Pam and Russ and Anne and Brenda and Dave, Phil and Hannah, not Karen, but Linda, and anyone else that we have time to hear. So thank you for your attention, and um, I look forward to what you have to share with us. So we'll start with Pam. Is that all right? Mic's on. Right there is good. Yep. Thank you. In the last 20 years of my life, I've experienced both the greatest. Hold on a is it coming through? You're going to get a little closer. Okay. In the last 20 years of my life, I've experienced both the greatest of joys. Hold on. Sorry. Take three. Yeah. Hello? Now we got it. Okay. I'm sorry. I just wanted people to hear you. Okay. <laughs> Actually, hold it. Pretend you're a diva. <laughs> okay. We'll try this again. In the last 20 years of my life, I've experienced both the greatest of joys and the depths of sadness. Most of the joys during the past 20 years have been through the expansion of my family. I gained a new stepfather-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and a son-in-law. I have gained three nephews, a niece, and two grandsons. <laughs> the biggest surprise I experienced was becoming pregnant at the age of 41 and being blessed with the birth of my son, Grayson, 17 years after the birth of my daughter, Caitlin. Both of my children have brought me great joy, and I thank God for them. I also expanded my circle of friends and have developed close friendships that I know will last a lifetime. Through this time of joy, my life was also beset with sadness. My marriage fell apart not once, but twice in a 15-year time span, and ultimately ended in divorce. My marriage was never easy, but I thought that that was just the way marriage was. By all outward appearances, we were simply a happily married couple. I learned to lower expectations and adapt, something that I thought all marriages needed to do to some degree to survive. But the challenges in my marriage continued to emerge, and in 2005, in a very uncharacteristic and impulsive manner, my husband moved out of our house to pursue another life. The pain of betrayal and abandonment totally consumed me. I fell into a deep depression and was barely able to function. My friends and family would come to my house in what seemed like shifts to help me get through those early days following the separation. They would sit with me as I cried and patiently listened as I recounted my truths over and over again. During this time, I fervently prayed to God to take the pain away and to restore my marriage, but this did not happen in the time frame that I wanted, and things got worse before they got better. Within a six-month time period, my husband left, both of my beloved grandfathers died unexpectedly, and I was served with divorce papers. I grieved for a long time, but it was during this time that my faith in God grew exponentially. I learned to live by faith and trust that the Lord will provide, and the Lord did provide. I learned to live with less, but never went without the basics. Gifts would be given to me by family, friends, the church, right when I needed them. This time of separation also empowered me to make important changes physically, mentally, and emotionally that have had lasting positive outcomes. After two years of separation, and against all odds, my husband and I reconciled. I was so happy to have weathered that storm and thought that it would be smooth sailing ahead. But that was not meant to be, and 15 years later, history repeated itself. As painful as it was to have to endure this all over again, I felt confident that I would survive. 
I had a strong support system with friends and family, and I naively thought, I've got this. Then COVID hit. During quarantine, my friends and family were no longer able to be physically present for me. I spent many of the long, drawn-out days ruminating over feelings of regret, anger, bitterness, and loneliness. The things I had taken for granted, family, friends, financial security, were now gone and despair had set in. My wise daughter told me, Mom, you need to start looking up. And that is what I did. God spoke to me through nature, songs, books, Bible verses such as Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This gave me the strength to get through this time of life one day at a time. A little over a year after my husband left for a second time, our divorce was finalized in November of 2020. After being married for 32 years, I found myself in a position of having to start over again at the age of 55. At first, I found this to be daunting. But as time passed, I have found comfort in the knowledge that God has a plan for my life. Each morning I awake to a plaque that hangs on my wall with the scripture verse Proverbs 31:25. She is clothed in strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. This is the woman I now strive to be. Through life's lessons over the past 20 years, I have come to terms with the fact that though undiluted sadness can be stifling and destructive, this emotion also gives birth to important things such as empathy and compassion. I have learned that happiness comes from having a heart of gratitude no matter what your circumstances are. I have also learned to live in the present because living too much in the past will make you depressed and worrying too much about the future will make you anxious. Two of my passions are reading books and watching movies, and I love to gather quotes from both of these sources. One of my favorite movie quotes is from the movie Kung Fu Panda. And it says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why they call it the present. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So I decided to take a slightly different approach and look to the words of others that would probably speak better than I to the situation. So I'm just going to share three one-sentence quotes. Can you hear me all right? Three one-sentence quotes and then a brief paragraph, and uh, I think you'll find it of interest. What separates us from animals, what separates us is our ability to mourn people we've never met. The author is David Leviathan. And the second quote, if we learn nothing else from this tragedy, we learn that life is short and there is no time for hate. And that quote comes from Sandy Dahl, the wife of the Flight 93 pilot, Jason Dahl from Shanksville, uh, lost his life in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The third quote is from a pastor. It was delivered on September the 14th, a memorial service held uh, for the, the disaster 9-11 by the Reverend Nathan Baxter. And he led a prayer, and this is what he said. As we act, we not become the evil we deplore. Interestingly, that one uh, prayer led one of our Congress people 
to change uh, her approach in how the vote would take place on uh, September the 14th. And I, I recently read this brief uh, interview uh, with her, and I thought this was interesting, what she borrowed from another culture. In the Akan language of the Ghanaian people, there's a mythical bird called the Sankofa. It's a beautiful bird with an egg in her mouth, but her head is turned to the back. The meaning is that in order to move forward with our young people, with a new day, with new directions, we have to look back. We have to understand the past. We have to know what is right. We have to learn from our mistakes. That's how we move forward. This, in many ways, is the Sankora moment for me. Looking back, understanding, learning, and saying we've got to move forward in a better way. Does anyone know who that person was? I didn't, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't learn it a long time ago. It was, uh, it was called, one. this is the interview, One Moment Solidified by Barbara Lee. And Barbara Lee voted as the only person in Congress to vote against the war in Afghanistan. I did some research on her and found it of interest that she attended a Catholic school, St. Joseph's Catholic School, and where she was taught by the Sisters of Loretto, an order dedicated to promoting justice and peace. I found out recently there's only 210 sisters that belong to the Sisters of Loretto, and they're based in Kentucky. Their 1812 motto is, we work for justice and act for peace because the gospel urges me. And so I thought, what difference could I make? And I recently joined the Rotary International and uh, Dave Ford and Nancy Ford belong, and they've initiated a peace initiative for young people, high school age, in our schools, our churches, and through youth groups. And their mission is to create peace ambassadors for the world. And so I pray to God that uh, as we move forward, there are more peace ambassadors, less conflict, and we resolve things in a peaceful way. Thank you. Good morning. I took a, a third approach to this assignment. Um, how, I, how have I changed since 9-11 and where is God in that change? Um, I related it to 9-11 specifically and uh, this is what I came up with. I was born on an island. Can't hear me? Oh. Can you hear me now? Okay. I was born on an island, the island of Manhattan. And I grew up a Yankee fan, loved Broadway, the museums, everything New York City. Although I moved to Pennsylvania years ago, I have never lost that close connection to the Big Apple. On the day that the towers came down, I was sewing a dress at home. I was filled with horror, sadness, and anger at the attacks. Although it turned out that I did not know anyone personally who was injured or died that day, I felt a deep sense of personal loss. I grieved and mourned and prayed. I prayed alone. I prayed with those close to me. I prayed with those not close to me. And I even prayed with those strangers who, whose faces appeared on my TV. There was a lot of praying in those days. It was as if we were all saying to each other, oops. Wait. Sorry, I lost my place. I missed a couple paragraphs here. As time went by, the pain of loss softened for me, as it did for others. But that softening was different this time. 
there was a change after 9-11. The grieving was displaced by a deep sense of caring for others. There was a strong feeling of unity among all of us. There was a gentleness in the way we treated each other. I noticed that following 9-11, saying, I love you, became unabashedly the ending to each phone call or email. It was as if we were all saying to each other, we're all in this together. I share your sorrow. I'm glad you are here. We are united in this. And you never know. So how have I changed in the 20 years since 9-11, and where do I see God's presence in, in that change? Aside from the practical changes that we now experience, like security in airports, concerts in public buildings, and the fact that we now have a Department of Homeland Security, I feel that I've changed in a spiritual way. I value much more than I used to that feeling of unity we experienced when we were all on the same team after 9-11. I look for unity everywhere. At times, it is evasive. But to this day, every time I hear or say I love you at the end of a phone conversation, I remember 9-11 and that feeling of unity. In that memory, I sense the presence of God, that same presence of God that can always be found in prayer. Reverend Seal Simmons Wood describes prayer like this, quote, prayer is something that we join. It already exists in every corner of the universe. It is a song that is being sung and we are simply invited to join in. I love this quote and in today's sermon, which quoted a psalm, which is a song, I remembered the line, it is a song that is being sung, and we are simply invited to join in. Um, I like this definition because it tells us that when we pray, we are still all in it together. It emphasizes that quality of unity, and it confirms the fact that even in our darkest hour, we are never alone. Good morning. I've selected a poem that was written by one of the um, folks from September 11th that lost a family member. It's called Our Past, Present, and Future. Our past is the stage upon which we walk. It colors everything we do, the way we think and talk. Our present is but a moment that we have caught in time. Without our past and future, it has no pattern, no reason, nor no rhyme. Our future is but a dream about a better day when our past and present will be merged and our grief and sorrows will be cast away. A time when the blinders will fall helpless from our eyes. Once more we'll see the spirits of our past once more their presence will be fully realized. A time when the people of this earth will live in peace and love. Finally, we will be governed by laws from God above. The spirits of our past are here, among us on this special day. They listen as we speak and play and guide us on our way. They love that we remember. They wish for us the best. They are glad to be a part of us. They pray that we'll be blessed. Soon our present will be our past and our future will be real. It will be what we have built today that will be our stage of steel. And that was by Jeanette Nelson. 
I also wanted to add that in the summer of 2002, a friend and myself were able to participate in um, a stock market class that was held in Manhattan on Wall Street in the stock exchange. And we spent the week in a hotel in South Street Seaport. But one day after our class, we were walking back to our hotel and we had to use the bathroom. And we happened to see a young man that was a bellman at a hotel. He was standing outside. And he said, oh, come on in. You can use the facilities here. We noticed that his eye was uh, a little different. So we went in, used the facilities. We came back out. And he said, I noticed you were looking at my eye. And I just wanted to let you know that, yes, I was involved in September 11th when the towers came down. I was caught beneath the rubble, and I lost my eye, and I'll have a glass eye. But he said, what I always remember is, thank God I could see the light, and someone had rescued him. Good morning. From, from Psalm 46, I read, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. It was early 1994, a few years before 2001, and Nancy and I were church shopping around Bloomsburg. We almost became Methodists. <laughs> but a chance stop at First English Baptist Church brought us to where we are today. Simply put, First English Baptist Church has been the cornerstone of our lives. And not the building but the people and the pastoral leadership. You as the congregation have been warm and welcoming, a refuge in strength in 1994, and you still are. During this time, we have always been involved in many programs and activities within the church, and during the lean years too, when there was not so much. But FEBC, has always been the cornerstone of Nancy's and my lives. And as the cornerstone, we have trusted God because he is our strength and refuge. God is in complete control. And that has made all the difference. Thank you. Good morning. 20 years ago, I'm sorry. 20 I got years nervous, ago, sir, all of a sudden. <laughs> 20 years ago, uh, Hannah and our lives were in a fog. Pastly, throughout your sermon, you said fog. We were in a fog. We were walking in a fog. In a fog. In a fog. Oh, I'm sorry. We were walking in a fog. My family members came to us and said, enough is enough. You have to get your lives together and we're gonna help you. And they did. And throughout that whole time, as time went on, the fog started to disappear. We went into recovery. We got our lives together. God blessed us with a beautiful daughter. And we went on and we came to Bloomsburg and we met all you guys who became really good friends of ours and really good, nice people to talk to. Throughout the whole time, I realized that I was never alone. I had all of you guys and my family and my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, and also had my family. And then I realized one morning, waking up 
foggy outside that throughout that whole travel and everything that I went through, it was footprints in the sand. God was carrying me and my, my beautiful wife through all, of, all this fog. And now we're here. And I thank God every day for being here and sharing the Sundays with each and every one of you. Thank you. So yesterday I'm trying to think, what was I doing on 9-11? And I realized I couldn't remember because I was in the fog. I was in the depths of my active addiction. I remember the first plane hitting and I'm waiting for my husband to come home with something to make me feel better. And when he walked through the door, I'm telling him, come here, look at this TV. Look at what's going on. Is this real? And the second plane hit. My first instinct was to call my mom. And then, come on, Philip, let's get high so we can feel better. The rest of the day is a fog to me because we were high. In the 20 years, twenty years of sobriety, I have become a frog. <laughs> I fully rely on God. I have seen so many miracles in my life. So many miracles. My kid is the biggest one. I was 37, Pam. <laughs> Ooh. I always had God in my life, but I didn't know it. I've always seek God in my life, but I didn't know it. But he always had me. He has you all whether you know it or not. Hmm. We thank God every day. God is around us every day. I was so supercharged this morning with your psalm. It mirrored my life. It totally mirrored my life. My other verse, and I just can't remember it, is in Jeremiah. For I know the plans I got for you, for you to succeed and not to fail. The chief thing is to remember God loves us every day, all the time. Amen. I found Travis's poem, so I guess I have to read it. <laughs> um, first, I'll just start real quick, and because uh, something I'll share. Um, so I'd like to say that I was in elementary school um, in 2001, but I was actually in my last year of my master's program. Um, not sure how I got so old. Um, and I was an adult returning student, so it wasn't like I went right there either. Um, and I remember the, it was a Saturday um, in Mar at Marywood, and we did Saturday classes, um, and I was going to become a social worker. Um, and I walked into class thinking things were going to go one way, and it was one of the strangest moments of my life. Um, I had two of my um, other students were um, self-described um, hippies, um, and they had both um, uh, very, all the time, um, talking about peace and love, um, and they had marched... Um, um, to protest the Vietnam War back in the day. And I walked into the two of them having a discussion as to which countries we should bomb back into the Stone Age. And it was one of the weirdest moments of my life. And they weren't joking, um, which was super concerning. And then our professor got up and was very tearful. Um, and at that point she um, admitted to us that she was married to a Middle Eastern man. 
and she was terrified um, for him and for herself that she wouldn't even leave um, the house um, after 9-11. So I know at the time there was a lot of unity and people coming together, which was great, but a lot of what I saw in social work school was the opposite, that even though a lot of us came together, there were a lot of us um, that didn't. Um, and what I have really tried to do since that time, again, I'm a social worker, um, bleeding heart here, um, is really dedicate my life to equality, um, to, um, to love. Um, and when Travis and I, back then I had no kids either, which is really weird. Um, but um, it, now um, looking on it, um, you know, Travis and I then, um, when our, um, we had Maddie and she was a little older and we decided we wanted to start going back to church, one of the things that I was passionate about was it had to be a church um, that chose love, um, which led us to this church. Okay, and now I'm going to try to get through this poem that my husband picked out. Um, he is not a public speaker, um, so here we go. Um, it is called Meet Me in the Stairwell. You say you will never forget where you were when you heard the news on September 11th, 2001, neither will I. I was on the 110th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I held his finger steady as he dialed. I gave him the piece to say, honey, I'm not gonna make it, but it's okay, I am ready to go. I was with his wife when he called as she fed breakfast to their children. I held her up as she tried to understand his words and that she realized he wasn't coming home that night. I was in the stairwell of the 23rd floor when a woman cried out for me to help. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for 50 years, I said. Of course I will show you the way home, only believe in me now. I was at the base of the building with the priest ministering to the injured and devastated souls. I took him home to tend his flock in heaven. He heard my voice and answered. I was on all four of those planes, in every seat, with every prayer. I was with the crew as they were overtaken. I was in the very hearts of the believers there, comforting and assuring them that their faith had saved them. I was in Texas, Kansas, London. I was standing next to you when you heard the terrible news. Did you sense me? I want you to know that I saw every face. I knew every name, though not all knew me. Some of them met me for the first time on the 86th floor. Some sought me with their last breath. Some couldn't hear me calling them through the smoke and flames. Come to me this way, take my hand. Some chose for the final time to ignore me, but I was there. I did not place some of you in the tower that day. You may not know why, but I do. However, if you were in that explosive moment in time, would you have reached for me? September 11th, 2001 was not the end of the journey for you, but someday your journey will end and I will be there for you as well. Seek me now that I may be found. Then at any moment you are, you are ready to go. I will be in the stairwell of your final moments. God. First of all, I'd like to say how proud I am of my daughter, and I would also like to say how happy I am to have Phil and Hannah with us. <laughs> Two months after 9-11, a close friend of ours who we had visited New York City with many times decided that she wanted to go to the 9-11 site. She wanted to see in person what it looked like and wanted to know if we wanted to go along. We decided that we would go on that trip. We went with her. We drove into New York City and then took a subway as far as it would go, but it only goes so far because of the destruction within the subway system too. We walked then for the rest of the way to the site. The devastation was unbelievable. 
it was a haze still covering the area. The spot where the towers were was gone, but for blocks around, there was not an unbroken window. There were buildings shrouded in black, some sort of black material. But the, there were trucks passing by carrying I beams that were twisted like pretzels. But the thing that was the most impressive to me was the quiet. People talked in whispers. You could hear nothing except the machinery that was working to clear away the debris. In the midst of that place, I found a strange piece, the type of piece in John 14, 27, when Jesus says, Peace is my parting gift to you, my own peace, such as the world cannot give. Set your troubled hearts at rest and banish your fears. I thought of the brave men and women who followed the command of Jesus when he says in John 15, 12, love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. I, saw the, I thought, thought of the passengers on the plane heading for Schnecksville that had given their lives to spare the capital. I thought of the men and women who ran into a burning building to save lives. I thought of all of those who stayed in harm's way to help others giving up their own lives. Over the past 20 years, I've watched as people have followed that example and rescuing people from floods, which are now so frequent they barely make air time, in fighting fires that are raging across our West, in feeding the hungry, in visiting the lonely, and most recently in caring for the hospital workers, in most recently the hospital workers who risk their lives caring for COVID patients. In the past 20 years, I've seen our country pull together after 9-11, fight and end two wars, pull itself back from the brink of financial disaster, and see a great period of financial prosperity pre-COVID. I've seen medical miracles since COVID in developing vaccines and improving treatments for COVID patients. We should be grateful. That's why I find it so confusing that the U.S. is now in a situation where church attendance is dropping with an unparalleled amount of people claiming no religious affiliation while forming their views of life from internet information. Political division is at an all-time high. There is racial unrest, disregard for all authority, a pandemic which has now killed more than all the people killed in 9-11 and cannot be controlled even though we have the tools to do it. Masks, vaccine, and improved treatments. On January 6th, the same capital that the passengers on the flight that went down in Schnecksville died to protect was desecrated by our own citizens. I struggled to make sense of things. Could it be our love of country has surpassed our love of God? Could it be that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself has been replaced by a quest for personal freedom? As I look back, I yearn for the days of my childhood when I stood by my desk and put my hand over my heart and could say with conviction, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, <clears throat> one 
nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I pray that we find a way to make America all the pledge and visions it can be. I pray that I can see the light. I don't want to cut anyone off. Is there anyone who feels moved to speak, to say a word or two? This is an opportunity. Thank you to all who have brought your personal experiences to us. We are deeply blessed and enriched by that. Thank you for your courage in stepping forward. Carolyn has a, a last a testimony here in song.
me for our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 502. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen.